Hey guys, Doug here from Motion Raceworks, here today with another episode of Motion 360. Today, our topic of conversation is going to be cooling systems. Actually, we're going to make this a four or five part series uh, because I feel like it's really important. There's a lot of lack of knowledge um, out there that's being passed around incorrectly. And it's probably one of the hottest topics I get about this time of the year as the uh, temperatures start to rise outside and people are getting their new projects together. Um, one of the big uh, phone calls I get is, my new project's overheating. Like, I can't go down the road. I can't cruise for more than 10 or 15 minutes. It's getting too hot. Doug, can you help me? Uh, this is what I have. And I always try to catch people on the front side of things like this because, man, it sucks to redo a car after you've built it. But I think that I can shed some light in ways that will help some people building cars and some people that are having an issue and hopefully... Um, cure that so you can enjoy your car more and um, race without it overheating and crap like that because it's not really a lot of fun when you're uh, overheating a car instead of racing it and there's no reason why you, even on the hottest of days you can't cool uh, today's types of cars with EFI and electronics and um, all of that there's no reason why you can't cool it off and have a car that runs well stays cool and you can turn around quick between rounds so I'm going to make this like a four or five part series because there's a lot more than I can discuss in one YouTube video or at least one that somebody will watch the whole way through. It's probably a little bit to digest. So today what we're going to start off with are radiators. Um, there's a ton of choices out there on the market. There's a lot of companies with bias and interest in selling you the most expensive radiator on the planet. Um, there's radiators that fit, there's radiators that don't. So we're going to start off with uh, just some basics about radiators so that you understand and know what you're looking for in terms of a good performance system. And then we'll break into what we suggest. So the basic uh, difference between a single pass and a dual pass is that there is a divider welded right here. Now what that does is when the water comes in, the water travels across here because it can't come all the way down to the outlet, travels all the way down there, and then it makes a corner and comes all the way back across before it comes out. The basic principle of a radiator is that the more time the water can spend going through um, something that is going to have air or another type of the real basic, um, probably oversimplification of a radiator is that the more time the water can spend going through fins with air passing through it, the more effective the radiator is going to be. So, you know, if this water came in right here and it all just flowed through and then it came out, you would only have this length of cooling for any given uh, piece of, you know, amount of water. So the general concept of the dual pass is that you not you have this length, it turns a corner and then it has this length coming back before it goes out so you in effect have double the cooling per the given size of radiator uh, this is a development I'm not sure when it happened but now they even make triple pass radiators in really really high performance high demand applications um, generally speaking this type of radiator has made a huge difference in my projects um, in terms of cooling I mean, on my own Drag Week Nova, I can't even get the thing when we're rolling down the road to get above like 160, 170 degrees on the hottest day. So um, this is gonna be your first and most important aspect um, of your cooling system. I always try to shoot and go standard with a dual pass radiator, and those are the reasons why, because you're getting double the cooling effect um, out of the same given size radiator. So disclaimer, before all the dumbasses come out of the woodwork and I have the internet troll saying, well, I use some whatever junkyard crap box radiator and it works fine for my combo. That's great. I've run single pass radiators on some combinations. They work well. But my general um, consensus or idea behind a cooling system is why not have the best one you can have? Um, I love the fact that on the cars I build that I can have a car turn around and cool in just almost no time after a run. And to me, it's worth an extra few hundred bucks up front to have a good radiator, a good water pump, a good fan setup that I can depend and count on. And I don't have to like uh, cross my fingers and pray to the rain gods or whatever and uh, hope that my car is going to cool when it's all done and it runs and everything. Um, I'm not going to get all scientific in this video. Number one, I'm not a scientific guy. But number two, 
Um, just go big. What's the holdup? I mean, if your car can fit a good dual pass radiator and it can fit um, a good set of fans and a pump and everything, why would you handicap yourself from the get go? Uh, me, I like to just race and cruise rather than try and uh, scab crap together. The other part of that is these radiators aren't necessarily expensive. Um, a lot of things in uh, the car world, I tend to buy the most expensive part or um, a really high quality part because I just think that a lot of things um, are expensive and high quality for a reason and I'll invest in that for my project. These, um, this is definitely an area where I don't necessarily condone spending tons of money on some big name brand uh, radiator. I think um, generic uh, dual pass radiators work fine as long as the quality is there. I've seen some really crappy ones where the uh, cores are uncrooked and stuff like that. But generally speaking, if you find yourself a good quality uh, dual pass radiator that's not welded by some seven year old Chinese boy, um, it's gonna work great. And I don't think it has to be a name brand and I think a lot of those companies are, um, they may have some good technology, but a lot of the times it's unnecessary. We're not racing NASCAR for 400 laps in 105 degree weather. We can cool our cars, our street cars, and even our drag cars um, with a real mid-level radiator, but we just need to follow the principles that, yeah, you probably shouldn't pull a radiator out of some junkyard and try and make it work with your car. That may be the issue. Of course, there's some other factors and we'll get into those in coming videos. So now that you have a dual pass radiator or you understand the concept of it, you're probably gonna ask me, but my hoses are gonna be different. Uh, mine started out one on this side, one down here, or vice versa, um, which isn't a problem. A lot of people are willing to switch to either making custom hoses. Um, I've spent the days at uh, O'Reilly's or wherever um, searching a wall for the perfect hose, and that can be a pain. Um, generally speaking, uh, 16AN hose is all you need. Uh, I see a lot of people trying to run uh, 20AN hose and it's just not necessary. I only ever run 16AN hose and that goes for drag cars, that goes for street cars, that goes for drag week cars. I don't care if you're driving 120 degree heat. Hose has never been a limiting factor for me. Um, of all the things we'll discuss today, a 16AN hose is plenty. And the reason why that's significant is because those 20 and hoses are absolute fortune. And you can only get them in straight, maybe 45 and 90, whereas 16 and hoses give you the ability to have everything from 30 degrees all the way up to 180 degree bends and everything in between. So why that's important is that, um, you know, there's gonna be stuff in front of your radiator. And that's one of the difficulties of a nice cooling system is um, your radiator, uh, generally speaking, it's going to be thicker than stock. Your fans are going to be thicker than stock. Um, a lot of times you're going to have turbo piping all over in the engine bay. So being able to make a versatile plumbing system is really crucial sometimes to making all of this come together. So while we're sitting here talking about fittings, um, the thing that a lot of people don't realize is this fitting doesn't care where it's at on the radiator. So um, if having a fitting come out in the front doesn't work, cover, you know, weld it up, put a fitting here, put two fittings here. Some of the pumps have twin number 12 fittings. Um, you can put it here, you can put it here. It's going to work. Um, you're going to want the fitting at the top, but it doesn't matter what orientation on the end tank is. Um, you can buy some blank radiators out there in this world, but generally speaking, a lot of them come, uh, pre-populated with fitting. So don't feel like you're obligated to use this fitting because it's here. There's nothing really holding you back from welding this hole up, putting one here, or buying a radiator that's blank and putting your own. Um, when the engine bed gets tight, that can make the difference between being able to plumb it easily and not. With boost, you're generally gonna want a little bit higher spring pressure than a standard uh, radiator cap. And the reason for that is, like I said before, you're gonna have coolant pressure uh, in a boosted vehicle. That's assuming that you have a boosted vehicle. When that coolant pressure goes up, it's gonna wanna pressurize the radiator higher and it's gonna wanna bleed off a bunch of coolant faster. Um, one thing I've found is increasing, I think we usually run like a 19 to 21 pound radiator cap and that works well. We only get a little bit of uh, 
coolant overflow on a real hot pass. Um, I think it's necessary to bleed off a certain amount of coolant if it needs to come out, but you don't want it coming out all the time and uh, you don't want that to become a huge issue. Somebody may have more science behind that, but that works well for me, generally speaking, on a car that makes, on a street car that makes like 30 pounds of boost, I'll run a 19 to 21 pound cap and it works great for me. Just a little bit of coolant and the overflow on a real heater of a pass, uh, just pass along that info. Now a couple other um, suggestions. So now that you got a lot bigger radiator, you're going to um, have to remount it. So a lot of people get real caught up on mounting and I have two simple um, concepts or little tidbits. When I'm mounting, um, what you wanna do is generally saddle this on the bottom right here. Um, I'll just create a little metal saddle. Sometimes uh, if it's on a street car, I'll try to get little polyurethane inserts. I think uh, there's, a couple, there's a couple companies that make them. Um, but I've also made them where they just have a nice rounded metal piece that it sits on, a little saddle, um, kind of like we make on our, kind of like we make on our uh, Fox body lower radiator mounts. And that works fine. The biggest thing is you just want to make there's not make sure there's not a whole lot of jagged edges for the metal to rub steel and aluminum on. Um, if it's just sitting in there and saddled, it's not going to rub through. You won't have an issue. Um, but supporting it properly from the underside is your most important part. And the reason why I say that is I see a lot of people um, basically trying to suspend the whole radiator from a mounting tab like here and here on each side and they just try to bolt it. And that's a lot of weight as a car bounces down the road and down the track and all that stuff. You don't want to just hang it by a couple tabs because you're sure to break off an aluminum tab. Um, whether you're a good welder of aluminum or, a, or not, it's just a lot safer to not have it mounted on that. And you can count on a lot less problems if you saddle it underneath. So generally what I will do, um, I'll mount, I'll saddle it underneath and then I'll just make a mount right here to bolt it to. Um, you don't have to get too crazy on that. And uh, I'll show you kind of how I have it mounted on my uh, own personal Nova. All I have is, um, if you can see it in there, uh, there's just an aluminum weld bung on there and I just bolt it through. So once it's saddled and then it's sitting on those uh, weld bungs, on, or it's bolted with those weld bungs on both sides, it can't go anywhere. And that's a good solid way to mount a radiator in a street car. Now, if you're the over safe type, by all means, use your polyurethane uh, mounts underneath. Um, you can rubber isolate it on the top, all that stuff. But generally speaking, if your car is not a shit box, and you have a little bit of bracing up front, um, none of that stuff's gonna flex enough to where it's gonna break a radiator or crack it or anything like that. I've heard a lot of people question real crazy stuff like that. And let me be the one to tell you, I've tried everything and how I just showed you on my Nova works really well. Um, you can count on that to not break uh, as long as your front support that it's sitting on and everything aren't just a flimsy pile of crap. That works really well. And on 99% of street cars, that's more than sufficient. So a little subsector. Um, if you have a race only car, a radiator is still very important. Um, I know a lot of guys choose to run real small, uh, what they call pro stock radiators, and that work, works really well. I've had uh, those on gasoline cars and on uh, alcohol cars, all that stuff. Obviously alcohol runs a lot cooler, so it's never nearly as much of an issue. But on a gasoline car, if you have a good, uh, say a Ron Davis triple pass radiator, there's a few other good brands out there, um, or double pass, I think they make a little bit of everything. Those work really well. And the reason why, especially if it's triple pass, is they triple the amount of area that the water's going through. So that little bitty radiator becomes a lot bigger radiator overall. And I would say the fin design and the overall design of a radiator of that sort comes into play a lot more than um, if you have a big old dual pass like we have here. So if that is your case and you're gonna go to a small radiator, that would be the time to consider to buy an expensive, well-made, um, not that these aren't, but a real expensive high quality radiator because it does make all the difference in the world versus some Gennaro piece. 
So leading into the next video, um, the one thing I will say is be very cognizant about your airflow in your car. If you have like a 93 to 02 Firebird or Camaro, those cars were designed to pick up air from underneath the car. So regardless of what radiator you put in there, um, you're gonna wanna make sure that you keep that lower air damp or some sort of that lower air damp because it will make the difference between a good and not good working combination in most cases, especially if it's a street car. Um, that air dam scoops up the air, and in many cars, that's the only place where it's gonna pick that air up from. Now, on a drag car, you can get away with not having that, but on a street car, when you're going down the road, it's gonna, you know, that radiator really benefits from the airflow. So be cognizant of that. Put that air dam back in, in any case possible. And then also be cognizant of about um, all the shrouding that comes from the factory. You know, if you look at a factory, especially a newer car, and even a lot of older cars, they have shrouding that, you know, covers between a bumper and a radiator on the sides and the top and the bottom. And that's made for a reason. Um, you can really benefit from putting a lot of that back on there or creating some type of carbon fiber or um, aluminum, sheet, steel, whatever you want to make uh, replacement for that because basically they're just directing the air. And in a factory vehicle, they're trying to use as small of a radiator that's as cheap to manufacture as possible to do the best cooling. So why not take advantage of that with yours? Uh, I see a lot of people that um, have heating, overheating issues, and a lot of it is because they just throw away all that crap. And uh, like I said, it's just free um, cooling that you can take advantage of, especially when you're cruising down the road. Especially, especially if you're pulling a trailer on Drag Week or Rocky Mountain Race Week, um, that type of stuff comes in a huge, uh, play with those types of cars. I have a friend that has a uh, Camaro that's never had an overheating issue. The second he put a trailer on the back, of course you could put a bigger load, it's turbocharged, starts heating up, and he had all kinds of cooling issues. They built like a little carbon uh, cardboard um, air dam for the car between the top of the front bumper and the radiator and the sides, and it fixed a lot of the cooling issues. So. Just a little tidbit, um, a lot of those panels you already threw to the side. If you can put them back on a car, do it. And I hope I'm able to teach you something because my ultimate goal is that you have less questions for us, which means you're having more fun and your car is more fun and uh, it's more usable and you're out there racing and driving rather than working on it. Let's do it right the Thanks first time. Thanks for tuning in. This has been another episode of Motion 360. I would love to have your feedback. Slam that like button if you like what you see. Share it with some friends, that's all we ask. We hope to just make uh, racing and cars a lot more fun for everyone and share our knowledge. Stay tuned, there's more to come.